in all of your blood, you should only have one little teaspoon of sugar. So our body very tightly controls how much sugar we have in our blood at one time. It does not like too much sugar. When you get into pre-diabetes, it's one and a half teaspoons of sugar. When you get into a full-blown diabetic state, it's only two little teaspoons of sugar. That's what diabetes is. That's a crazy small amount. You probably thought it was a lot more. But then the question is going to come up, don't people consume a lot more than that? Yes, they do. An average person consumes between 50 to over 100 teaspoons of sugar every single day if you include the hidden sugars from starch. So starch is hidden sugar. How does one consume so much sugar, yet if they're a diabetic, only have like a couple teaspoons of sugar show up in their blood? Well, that's because there's something behind the scenes sucking it out like a vacuum cleaner, and that is called insulin. So insulin works really hard to bring the sugars down, and it's taking all the sugar and putting it into different parts of the body, and sometimes it converts it into fat, Sometimes it converts into stored sugar in the liver or the muscles. Doctors are focused on blood sugar. They don't really test for insulin too much. They should, because if they did test for that, they would find it's like off the charts with the amount of sugar that an average person consumes. But what happens if you don't eat any sugar at all? Would your normal blood sugar still be one teaspoon? And the answer is yes, it will, because your body needs a small amount of sugar, just a tiny bit to survive. As you can see, one teaspoon. So it's gonna just make the sugar. The liver is gonna make this extra sugar and it can make it out of pretty much anything. We don't actually need sugar. The problem is we consume too much. And now we can't get all that sugar out of the blood. And then it starts going a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And that's what we call type two diabetes. And in that process, you should just know about this other thing called insulin resistance because the body also does not like too much insulin. So what happens in different tissues, you start developing this resistance to insulin. It starts with too much carbohydrate and sugar and snacking. Another thing you should know about is we need insulin to be able to pull in the glucose, but with insulin resistance, the body's going to have a difficult time holding in the glucose. And this really is the problem with a lot of chronic disease and even dementia and Alzheimer's. They call it type 3 diabetes of the brain. Why? Because you've consumed too much carbohydrate for too long. Another little interesting thing about that, when someone becomes a diabetic, 80% of the sugar in their blood is actually created or made by the liver. It's not coming from the diet. Only 20% comes from the diet, but most of it is coming from the liver. Now, why would the liver be making that much sugar? It's because all the messages all screwed up. It thinks it's not getting enough glucose, so it has to then make a lot of it. And this is why metformin is prescribed, which indirectly lowers the blood sugar by telling the liver to stop making sugar. That's how that works. When you go to the doctor, they screen for your blood sugar. Eventually they say you're a diabetic and now we have to treat you. So in other words, they're gonna wait until finally things are dysfunctional and then they'll treat you. And they'll treat you with medication. They don't put a lot of emphasis on diet or telling you to lower your carbs because 95% of doctors disagree with going on a low carb diet and they think it's dangerous, mainly because of propaganda and media that's pushing it out there but instead you're given a medication to manage that blood sugar. And then you're also sometimes told if your blood sugars go too low to have this glucose tablet or pill or eat some candy to raise the blood sugar. So some doctors are more concerned with a low blood sugar situation than a high blood sugar situation. So it's all about managing that biomarker. It's not about reversing. Also hypoglycemia typically is about 70 milligrams per deciliter, okay? Like normal is 80, and then 70 is considered hypoglycemia. 
So if a diabetic has a blood sugar of 90, they might be experiencing the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Yet other people that are normal, like that might be even a little too high for them, or that might be normal for them. And they consider normal between 80 and 100. Personally, I think it should be 80. And then when you go on a low carb diet, that 80 will go down to a 70 and that'll be your normal or even 60. And I've even seen it even lower than that. And there's no hypoglycemic symptoms at all. Because if you train your body not to live on carbohydrates and you can live on fat and ketones, your body won't depend on all this extra sugar. So let's go through a couple points with this. Number one, not washing your hands before you check your blood sugar. Let's say, for example, you're eating some fruit and you cut some fruit and you get some juice on your fingers and that mixes with the blood sugar, that can easily alter it. It's called pseudo hyperglycemia. It's really important to wash your hands with soap and water and let them dry and then you know, test your ring finger or your index finger. Number two, let's say you use alcohol wipes and you wipe your finger, but the alcohol is still wet and you test it. That can create a difference between 10 and 40 points going up. So that can give you a false number. So wait at least 30 seconds for the alcohol to fully dry. And the other point I wanna make is sometimes alcohol wipes had added glycerin which can also alter your blood sugar. So I would use the ones that don't have glycerin because glycerin is kind of sweet. Number three, do not use expired strips because you don't know if they still work and that can make your readings incorrect. Number four, if you experienced a sauna or something really hot or a cold plunge, both of those scenarios can alter your readings by up to 30 points either going up or going down. So you want to keep the strips in a kind of a good temperature and keep your body in a, a good normal temperature. Uh, what about Tylenol? Yeah, that can increase your blood sugar if you're taking Tylenol right before you test yourself. Or even vitamin C can alter the blood sugar going up by 30 to 50 points. If you're testing your blood sugar like in the morning in a fasting state, don't take any vitamins before you test it. Just don't even drink any coffee, which I'm going to cover in a little bit because that can majorly affect it. Also, if you're squeezing or milking your finger, you're also squeezing the interstitial fluid and mixing that with the blood sugar, diluting the blood sugar, and that can alter your blood sugars by dropping by up to 30 points. You just want to very gently have that blood drop and then have it sucked into the little tester to test your blood sugar. Number eight, using different fingers can give you an alteration in your reading. I would use your middle finger and your ring finger. I wouldn't use the other fingers unless you absolutely had to because that can vary the results. Now, what about number nine? You're using a continuous glucose meter okay, versus a finger prick. The continuous glucose meters measure things differently. They're measuring the interstitial fluid, so they're measuring your blood sugar indirectly. So if you're testing your blood sugar after a meal, you're gonna see a delayed reaction versus the finger prick. So you just need to know that and wait longer after a meal. If you are doing a post-meal test, you wanna wait one to two hours, not before, not after. You have one to two hours and then do that consistently if you're monitoring your blood sugar also, if you are sleeping on that continuous glucose monitor and there's a lot of pressure on there and then you test in the morning, that could affect the reading as well. Also, if you're testing in high altitudes, like if you're at 10,000 feet, your readings are going to be off because there's less oxygen. Number 11, I already mentioned coffee. But coffee has caffeine. Caffeine can actually increase adrenaline and cortisol, which could indirectly cause your body to make more sugar by up to 20 points. And this is just an extra point I wanna bring up. Stress can activate blood sugar. The hormone involved with stress is cortisol. Another name for cortisol is glucocorticoids because it's a hormone that regulates and releases excess glucose. So I just wanted to point that out 
as well. Number 12, when you check your blood sugar in a fasting morning state and it's high, but you didn't eat anything for the last 12 hours, like, wait a second, how can that be? That's called the dawn phenomena, okay, where you wake up in the morning and the blood sugar is high. Now, what happens at 8 o'clock in the morning is, and it could be at 7, it could be even at 6, or it could be 9, is you do have a spike of cortisol, like I just talked about that. So you have the highest spike of cortisol at that time, so that could release it. But more than that, it's a problem with insulin resistance in your liver, and your liver is just making more sugar. It's like a sugar factory. And so in the morning, it's going to be high if you have insulin resistance. So I'm going to show you how to reverse diabetes and also fix that. But the point is, sometimes in the process, it could take some time. It could take some months. It will improve over time, but the point is that you're just, if you see high blood glucose in the morning, just realize that's insulin resistance of the liver. And number 13, dehydration can alter blood sugar by 10 to 15 points. Dehydration occurs not just with a lack of water, also a lack of electrolytes too, including salt, potassium, magnesium. So just make sure that you're hydrated when you test your blood sugar. A1C is another test they do to measure the average of three months. So we're not necessarily going to look at the spikes and the ups and downs. We're going to look at the average of how much sugar is stuck to your hemoglobin. What's interesting about A1C is you have different cultures like Asians, African American, Hispanic versus Caucasian blood cells are going to be a little different. With Caucasian red blood cells, their red blood cells die a little bit sooner than people of Asian descent or African-American or Hispanic. So in other words, if you're Asian, African-American, or Hispanic, and your A1C is just a little bit more than someone else that's Caucasian, that actually could be normal. Okay, I just want to bring that out. Also, if you're anemic, that can also alter this A1C. If you've been on the low-carb ketogenic diet for a period of time, the red blood cells will live a little longer and that will also alter this as well. So you have to kind of take in consideration all these factors. Let's talk about reversing type 2 diabetes. It's actually, from my viewpoint, it's incredibly easy. It does take some time, but the thing about diabetes is that the liver is at the core of this problem because all this extra glucose that's made by the liver then turns into fat in different places in the body, including the liver. So now we have this liver that becomes fatty, insulin resistance, and dysfunctional. The good thing about this whole problem is that the liver responds really fast when you do low carb. The lower your carbohydrates in your diet, the faster the liver will respond by getting rid of fat off the liver and by correcting this insulin resistance and with a low-carb diet, within weeks, you can take off at least 50% of that fat from that liver. All you have to do to correct diabetes is to go on a low-carb ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting because not only do carbs increase blood sugars and insulin, but also the frequency of eating. So if we just have two meals a day or even one meal a day, Boy, you're going to be good if you keep your carbs low and then you give it more time. Some people can reverse their diabetes in 10 weeks. Sometimes it's a little bit less. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. But in medicine, they don't ever like to be very positive about putting anything in reversal. But there's a few great studies I'm going to put down below by Verda Health that talked about reversal. And it's pretty credible. You should check it out couple things you can add to this to speed it up. Exercise, consistent, regular exercise. Apple cider vinegar in water diluted before meals, like one tablespoon. If your blood sugar is high in the morning, go for a walk and burn off that sugar. Berberine is a good natural alternative that acts like metformin. Keeping your sleep good, keeping your stress down, getting enough sunlight are all really important things. 
but I have a detailed video on how to do the ketogenic diet right here. I highly recommend you watch it right now. Check it out.